Hi, and welcome to this video for tips and tricks on complex installations of the 20 millimeter profile linear guides. My name is David McCaddy, and I am the team lead of the mechanical engineering design team here at Invention. So in some of your assemblies, you may require guide rail lengths that are longer than the lengths we offer. In those cases, luckily the guide rails are butt jointable. Uh, in these instructions, I'm gonna be giving you some tips and tricks for being successful with that installation process. There are a few important considerations when designing and assembling a butt jointed rail system. Most importantly, butt joints will actually reduce the life expectancy of your bearings. So use as few butt joints as possible. This is because the slight misalignment between rails, even if very small, is like a bump for the ball bearings to roll over and that will cause extra stress to the bearing system. Similarly, it is important to ensure that rails do not have joints at the same location along their axis. Hitting two joints at the same time will have a much higher internal stress in the bearings than only one side passing over and then the other side passing over afterwards. So make sure that these joints are offset similar to how we lay bricks for a building. In the same thought process, we can apply that to extrusions where we do not want to have a butt joint of the rail system at the same location as a butt joint of the extrusions. This will be a weaker point in the frame and allow for more motion under load and will allow for the rails to more easily misalign with each other, causing damage to the bearings. With all those considerations in mind, let's move on to the installation process for butt jointed rail systems. So on this side, we have a rail that is fully installed to our standard specifications. You can find the video uh, covering that installation on Vention.com. And then on the other side here, on your left side, we have a loose rail. So you can see now if I move this, it's completely loose. And so our video here is gonna focus on how do we join these two rails together so that they are properly aligned and secured. The first step in doing this successfully is going to be ensuring that you have one of these rail supports with its center pretty much directly spread between the two rails. It's very important that each rail has two bolt holes. So you can see there's four in total here going through the support, and that will ensure that we get a good connection. Installing this butt joint is going to be very similar to installing a, ra a standard rail, except they're gonna be applying some force from the end, or you can hold the rail from the middle to ensure that this joint is closed and held together the entire time. I'll be using a four millimeter Allen key here. And one other tip is it's important that the support in the middle here between the two is loose. All of the other ones on the previous rail are tight, but this one is where we're gonna be starting our torquing activities. So taking the four millimeter Allen key, we start to snug up these bolts and similar to our installation for a standard rail, I'm just doing these lightly finger tight, approximately one to two Newton meters. What this is gonna do is it's gonna pull the rail into the correct position on the datum surfaces before we torque everything down to full specification. I'm going to continue this along the rail, again just going finger tight, and this is going to ensure that the entire length of this rail, which was previously loose, is sitting nice and flat, and uh, it won't change position after we torque the bolts afterwards. At this point, there should be enough friction force that you can release your hand pushing the joint together, and you won't have to worry about the rail moving. With all of these fasteners snugged tight, uh, just finger tight, we can now move on to the use of our torque wrench. As standard for these linear guide rails, all the fasteners will be torqued to something between 10 and 11 Newton meters. And our approach here is going to be mainly to focus on this center section first to ensure that we get the two rails in the correct position. So just like we install when we install a standard rail, I'm torquing these partially first to ensure that all of the datums are nice and snugly held together. And now we can go back and apply full insulation torque. Now that we've torqued all the fasteners in this joint together, you can see that the joint is actually very smooth. You can't see any visible gaps. You may be able to see this slight line. However, I cannot see any light through the gap and there's no way for anything to pass through it. It's very important that this gap is very tightly pushed together. If you do see any gaps here, it's important to then loosen all the fasteners, start again by pushing the rail and re-snug re them up and repeat the process. A good way to tell if the quality of the rail joint is good is these curved sections in the rail. We can pass our fingernail over it and I can barely or even not even at all feel the joint between the two rails. We'll be double checking this with a tool, but that's just a good sensory way to get a validation that your joint is, has been successful. I'll continue along the rest of the rail torquing these fasteners to spec. We'll return with an inspection using the dial indicator to validate that the joint between the rails is within specification. 
So for the inspection with the dial indicator, what I suggest doing is taking one of your bearings from your existing system and removing the bearing mount from it. This is because we're going to use the nice uh, steel surface on the top of the bearing to mount the magnetic mount for our dial indicator. So I'm gonna be mounting it like so, turning the mount on, and you can see now it's nicely held in place. This allows us to move the dial indicator along the length of the rail. The next step here is going to be positioning the dial indicator so that we're reading along one of the bearing races. So again, that's the curved groove in the side of the rail. So once you've mounted your dial indicator, uh, we're gonna approach the joint position here. I've positioned the dial indicator so that it's inside the race, the bearing race on the top corner closest to you guys. And it doesn't really matter if your dial indicator is set exactly to zero because we're looking for the difference between before and after the joint. Uh, however, if you wanna dial zero your dial indicator, you can. Right now we're measuring minus 0.04 millimeters. And if I go across the gap, now we're at minus 0.02 millimeters. So that is within the specification of 0.02 millimeters for the alignment of the joints. Uh, so this process will need to be repeated for all four races on the rail at each joint along the butt jointed rail system. And with that validation complete, uh, your butt jointed rail system is in specification and you're good to go. For this second half of the video, we're gonna be covering shimming. You might need to shim because your guide rail is traversing multiple extrusions. These extrusions have some variation in manufacturing, and when going from one to the other, you may have a slight change in width. This would be a situation where you would need to use shims to offset that change. Another situation where you might need to use shims is if you have a very large assembly, you may need to use shims to get your final alignment into place instead of moving around large pieces of the frame to achieve your alignment. Depending on the size of your assembly, it may be more practical to measure the distance between your rails with a vernier caliper, uh, which can be used depending on the size of your caliper. Here I have a 12 inch one, so if our rails were within 12 inches of each other, I could measure the variation that way. Alternatively, what we suggest is if you have a large assembly, to use a dial indicator similar to what we used in the first half of this video, mounted to a steel plate which we sell on our website, invention.com, and that way we can measure the variation between the two different rails. What you need to do is determine where your widest point of your rails are, mark that spot using a Sharpie or some kind of indicating tool, and then from that point, measure all the other distances along the rail, tracking that variation from the widest point. That number, that variation, it's going to be equivalent to the thickness of shim that you'll have to install at that location. So once you've determined that thickness, you can get all of your shims organized, and I'll show you guys now how to install the shim successfully so that you can space out your rail. So let's say we had a gap over here. So I need to move this part of the rail out by a little bit. What we're gonna start off by doing is loosening the fasteners on this binder plate. We do this because we actually install the shims between the rail and the rail support itself. We will also have to loosen the fasteners attaching the rail to the, the extrusion. And now I'll actually completely remove the binder plate. So now that we've removed the binder plate, we can now install the shim in between the rail and the rail support. You'll want to align the slot of the shim with the bolt hole. Because what, we'll, what we will do is align the bolt itself with the slot in the shim, and this will hug the sides of the bolt. So we can do that now, and we will be sliding the shim in behind the rail and pushing it into place just like that. Once you've installed all the shims that you need to according to the measurements that you made in the previous step, we can then reinstall our binder plates. Now that you've reinstalled the binder plate finger tight with the Allen key, We'll need to go back with the torque wrench and follow the standard instructions for rail installation and ensure that all the fasteners are torqued to the proper specification from 10 to 11 newton meters. Just a special note about shims, when handling them, do be careful because these are very thin pieces of stainless steel and they can cut your skin if you're not careful. So do handle these with care. With that, when you're completed your reinstallation, you'll wanna go back with your measurement tool of choice and just verify that the distance between the rails is within the tolerance of 0.05 millimeters. And if with all checks you're within that range, you're good to go and start operating and your shimming process is complete. And that concludes our video on complex tips and tricks for the installation of 20 millimeter linear profile guides. Thank you for watching and for any questions and to follow along with the steps in this installation, visit the technical document found at vention.com.